actually ever hear from if we do our normal day to day one of C uh, presentations. Uh, so we're lucky to have, we're not only lucky to be close to an airstream, but have uh, Troy and be such a great um, kind of lead economy. Um, we're trying to make it more of a hub, but trying to really grow it. Um, but that's what makes me excited. And also that we get to hear from uh, new companies all the time because this is the only business weekly event in Wellington. Yeah, we can present with other companies, um, hopefully find some new solutions, just being the community to create brand awareness. And that's kind of what One Million Cups is. So today, um, we have in the past, we've done a lot about um, apps or online um, kind of platforms where you can find farms and 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 uh, learn more about uh, what's out there. Um, but now I actually get to hear from uh, the farmers themselves. And so I'll let Troy do some more specific intros, but well. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad everybody's here. We got a we got a little bit of rain this morning. Everybody's a little quiet. Um, that's all right. We needed the rain. That's that's fine. Uh, we were just talking about that being an impact with farms. Uh, we're painting one million cups blue. So all throughout uh, the month of June, the the companies that come and present are some, in some way, shape, or form linked to the blue economy. So you're here at the university. You ask the guy from the university to show up. So now I need. We're gonna have a quiz. What is the blue economy? Up your hand and shout it out. But uh, economy and the ocean environment, blue credits, uh, carbon credits. Oh, <laughs> thank you. You're, you're just like walking in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just walks in and doesn't answer. So, so the reality is, a uh, great answer. Anybody want to add anything to the answer, which was anything in the ocean? Right? Rivers. Water rivers. Water. Yeah, Troy's going to throw in the river. I'm going to Solar, get... wind. Um, I'll depends on where it is, right? So it's got to touch that water, right? And it's got to be integral to the water, yeah. Technologies that help create value. Technology that help create value in the blue economy. Right. Right. Does it deal with lakes and uh, uh, freshwater stuff too? Or? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Troy's definition. Let me let me let's put Lots this thing. Troy as well. Huh? Ocean photography as well. Anything that, yeah. that we get yeah. those what kinds of impacts, right? And so so one of the yeah. things we're raising awareness of what's going on in the in the blue environment. I'm going to also throw in there that water quality, water quantity thing. Uh, probably not as big an issue uh, here, but out on the left coast, they talk a lot about water rights, you know. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, recently I, I had a, attended a presentation where the gentleman talked about the, the in the next decade, the big discussion will be how, how folks on the East Coast change their view of water rights. I was really, really interested in, in that. So maybe we'll get somebody to come talk about that. But we last week we did apps for seafood and and uh, the oyster trail where you can go and, and either find oysters, get a tour, see an oyster farm, uh, talk to a farmer, or go get some oysters to eat. Uh, and today we're going to actually bring in a, a couple of folks that are going to talk about one oysters and the other uh, uh, ocean photography. Uh, first up, we're going to have Keith Walls with Falling Tide uh, Oyster Company. He's going to talk to us a few minutes about his oyster company. I knew Keith, but you started out as a chef. Yeah, and a long uh, time ago, 2011 is when I came here and started school. Yesterday, yesterday, yesterday right? Yeah. So, so yeah, you came in here. I mean, 2011 um, and 2012. When did you graduate? Uh, undergrad 2013 and grad school 2015. So, so around, around 2015. And then he decided he, got, he was really interested in GIS and, and how you look at the world through those data lenses. And then he decided oyster farms. So now we're going to give him a, a few minutes to talk about uh, uh, shellfish aquaculture and how he got involved with oyster farms and what's going on with uh, falling tide oyster. Sure. No. I can just say next slide. Okay, good morning. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk to you about my company and about aquaculture in general, shellfish aquaculture specifically. 
Uh, as Troy mentioned, my name is Keith Walls, and I am the owner of Falling Tide Oyster Company. Uh, I started here at UNCW in 2011 uh, as an undergrad, and I actually got my bachelor's degree in environmental science from UNCW, uh, a post-baccalaureate certification in geographical information science, and a master's degree in marine science with a focus on aquaculture. Uh, I spent my master's thesis work uh, developing a geospatial model to identify growing areas throughout the state and rank those according to how suitable they were for aquaculture and growing oysters specifically. And uh, Troy mentioned I started as a chef. I actually have an associate's degree in culinary arts from way back when I was 20 years old. And then this aquaculture thing kind of pulled it all together and I found this niche between science, <laughs> applied ecology and culinary arts and it just sort of fit who I am and that's why I, I went this direction. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that my wife is also an owner of this company and I have a little one-year-old daughter who is the future of this company. Uh, so we are a family-owned company and we cultivate premium shellfish and we use sustainable contemporary aquaculture techniques. So when I say contemporary, I mean we use uh, floating gear and we float our cages and grow our oysters in the water column, which is uh, opposite of the traditional way people used to grow oysters, which was just to spread them on the ground um, or relay them to a, a bottom lease. Um, I'm going to be kind of quick with the presentation and leave a lot of time for questions because I figure there will be a lot of questions and I don't want to get into the weeds of the numbers too much of our company, but feel free at the end to ask me any questions, anything that I don't cover. Um, Oh, there it is. So our company uh, leases 10 acres of bottom and water column from the state of North Carolina. The waters in North Carolina are public trust waters, so they belong to the citizens of North Carolina. They are leased for private use from the Division of Marine Fisheries, and uh, the leasing program falls under the Habitat Enhancement Section of the Division of Marine Fisheries. That's because of the ecosystem services provided by aquaculture. Um, there are not any other that I can think of or that I know of private businesses out in the water that are leased from the state um, because there's the benefits of aquaculture is what gives us that opportunity to do what we do because we're providing these services, water filtration and others, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we lease 10 acres on five different farm sites um, to try to diversify our growing areas and the flavor of the oysters because they represent the area they're grown in. Areas closer to the inlet typically have a saltier oyster with more marine influence, like our topsail farms. And then our farms in Stump Sound are generally a lower salinity uh, and earthier oyster, a lot more organic matter coming into the system up there. Um, and it's just a different flavor profile. Uh, works really well as a nursery area, which is why we selected it. Um, and then we have a one acre clam lease only that we are about to plant clams on, which is down here by Rich Inlet, um, you know, near Lee Island. So, so that's where our farm sites are. Uh, they're spread out and uh, we, we sell approximately 250,000 oysters a year, uh, mostly distributed regionally uh, to wholesale. Uh, we use inland seafood out of Charlotte and local seafood out of Raleigh. And then we do some direct delivery here to Wilmington using our refrigerated van. But our primary lump of our sale is wholesale, um, typically 2,000 to 2,500 per shipment once or twice a week from these distributors and they pick up from our facility in Sneeds Ferry. Um, we have three recognized brands on the market um, and we have a respectable market share. And when I say that, I mean that we got in fairly early with comparison to some of the other newer growers that are coming in. And so we've had an opportunity to establish these relationships with the distributors and work closely with them for a number of years now, which has kind of given us a good foothold in the market. Uh, there are a number of larger farms, much larger than we are, but we're also not the smallest, you know, we're kind of, um, you know, right there in the middle. And, and I think, uh, and we're growing, you know, so, so we have a nice respectable market share at this point. Um, 
This is just a picture of a couple guys that work for me. Uh, this is our sorting tube that we use, which I can talk about in a few minutes. It tumbles and cleans our oysters and helps to sort them by size, which is all part of, you know, creating, using contemporary methods to create a uniform shaped, beautiful oyster for the raw bar market primarily. Um, that's what we target is the raw bar market. We also sell some direct to the public uh, retail around the holidays for, for oyster roasts and things like that. Those are typically our oysters that are too big for the raw market or just, you know, didn't quite shape up the way we wanted them to. Not every oyster is a supermodel. You know, some of them, we work on them, we work on them, we work on them, and they still kind of have their flaws. You know, they're like snowflakes. Every oyster is a little different. So some of them, Great for cooking in the backyard, not so much in the raw bar market. Like mis um, misfit. Yeah, yeah, or irregulars. You know, sometimes people buy organic, irregular fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. Same kind of idea. So these are the three brands that we have on the market. Our Carolina Dreams are our top sellers out of Stump Sound. Um, our top secrets come out of our Topsail Sound Farms. And then we have this phenomenon that occurs here um, seasonally. We've had a miss year here or there. Um, this year we had a shorter window, but we do have a, a green gill oyster that we market as Carolina Envy, and we sell that, um, you know, typically in the late winter, early spring is when that phenomenon happens. Um, so those are the three brands we have, have on the market. Um, benefits of shellfish aquaculture. There is a lot more than this, but... This is the reason we're allowed to do what we do. And the reason I put this picture on here is because it clearly shows, you know, you have a lot of productivity in and around these cages. And the number one thing I think that aquaculture does is it, it filter, oysters filter water and an adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. So we have a half a million oysters on our farm. So you multiply that by 50 gallons a day and then you add the other four or five farms around us that have an equal amount or greater amount of oysters. And it's my estimation that we probably turn over the entire bay around Bermuda Island where we are once a day just in filtration. So there's a lot of filtration going on there. And, and with that, you have uh, nutrient cycling. So a lot of nitrogen being pulled out of the water column and deposited into the sediment, which stimulates the nitrogen cycle through denitrification to nitrification. And so you have a, a full nutrient cycling and removing uh, nutrients from the water column, which is important. Um, shoreline erosion control. A lot of big yachts go up and down the ICW, eroding the marsh with wakes and everything like that. We're next to some of those marsh islands. And I can tell you that those waves, when they hit our farm, they immediately get knocked down and that protects the adjacent shoreline. So just like a, uh, a living shoreline in front of a property, you know, in substitution for a bulkhead in certain situations can attenuate wave energy. Same thing with our cages. You know, we have 190 cages currently in service and 100 more ordered. So we have 300 cages, five farm sites that so we protect uh, shoreline uh, with, those, with those cages. And then the, the other big ones, habitat for juvenile shrimp, crabs, and fish, a lot of those recreationally important species, um, you know, they start off in and around their cages and they find refuge there and uh, they're protected until they can get bigger and then somebody can catch them or harvest them or whatever. So, you know, we stimulate the crab, blue crab fishery you know, the shrimp fishery, all of those fisheries benefit from oysters because oysters in general are a keystone species in the wild. But, you know, these cages are essentially artificial reef for these species to congregate in and around. And then that leads to predatory species being able to swim around the farms and, and hunt and forage. So there's opportunities for those recreationally important species as well. Um, so really, we are a foundation for the other fisheries to build on. Um, carbon sequestration, that's something a lot of people may not know, but uh, oysters sequester carbon. You know, the, the shells are made of calcium carbonate, and there's a lot of carbon stored in an oyster shell over several, farm, you know, many farms, many millions of oysters. And those, when they're harvested, 
unlike a tree that's burned or something like that, that carbon stays sequestered in that shell. So that's that's an important thing as we move forward with uh, climate climate change issues and things like that. And then another big one is it reduces pressure on the wild fishery. So we don't take anything from the wild. We are a put and take fishery. We don't take, you know, we don't just take, take, take from the wild fishery. We, we put oysters out there that we purchase from a hatchery as a seed. And then we harvest those oysters that we put out there and we don't take anything from the wild fishery. So we're taking pressure off the wild fishery actually by not contributing to harvesting from the wild fishery, which is under a lot of pressure um, from overfishing and from numerous environmental stressors. Um, I'm sure there's others that, that I'm not gonna get into now. It's only a few minutes, but this is the, the big thing for us, the challenges. And I could probably do an entire presentation for several hours on just the challenges. You know, first and foremost, we're farmers and farmers are at the mercy of mother nature. So we have all the same problems that terrestrial farmers have. And then we have all the additional challenges that come with working in the marine environment. Um, hurricanes, it's hurricane season. My stress level was way up. I was checking this morning. Now there's a tropical storm already. And there's another one behind it. So I'm, I, this time of year, I'm, you know, every day, weather, tide. Every morning, my life revolves around the tides, the weather. Hurricanes, drought. We've been going through a, a serious drought the last two years. Up in Stump Sound, we've lost hundreds of thousands of oysters in the last two years. Farmers across the entire state have lost oysters in certain pockets related to drought conditions. Salinity was 38 parts per thousand in Stump Sound two days ago. That's not good. The ocean's 35 or 36, so we're above that. We were almost 40 back in April. And so when, it, when the animals, undergo stress like that, they stop eating. And when they stop eating, they just starve and then they die. And so there's a number of stressors that are hitting the animals right now related to drought. Um, you know, fouling is also changed and we have a whole new community of fouling organisms on our cages now that we didn't have two years ago. Our old problem was Polydora, which is a, a little polychaete worm that likes to grow in the shell of the oyster. And if you ever shuck an oyster and you see little black marks or stripes on the oyster, that's typically a, called a mud blister. And we try to keep those out of our oysters. <clears throat> but we don't even have polydora anymore. It's been, we haven't had any rain. So we've had a complete community shift in our fouling organism. So now we've got this red bryzo and that loves to grow all over the cages. And if you leave it unchecked, it will wipe out your entire crop. So we've got all kinds of issues related to drought that we deal with. And coastal development, that's a huge one. That's the big one that I'm going to point out as a long-term problem for the aquaculture industry in general, and particularly the lower part of the state. You know, there are certain pockets where that is not as big of an issue, but everybody sees the construction and the development that's taking place along the coast around here. And those impacts have an effect on our farms. So that's a really big one. And that one affects water quality, which can affect our entire operations. You know, Troy mentioned the blue economy. The blue economy only works if the blue part of that, at least for us, is clean, unpolluted, and, you know, allows us to do what we need to do to grow oysters. If the water quality doesn't, if there's no, if there's poor water quality, then, you know, it doesn't work for us. So that's the lifeblood of our operations. Fouling, I talked about fouling is when stuff grows on your pages and barnacles, bryzo and things like that tries to grow on your oysters. And we try to uh, flip our cages over regularly to dry the cages, which simulates sort of an inner tidal, like, uh, you know, when you see oysters up along the fringe of the marsh at low tide that are exposed, those oysters are drying. So we try to we try to simulate that by flipping cages over and drying our cages. And then that keeps those things at bay, you know, keeps them from really growing all over the, the oysters and, and reducing the quality of your oysters. Uh, lack of protection for growing areas. That's the big one. You know, we're at the mercy of mother nature, but we're also unprotected out there. There is no protections for the growing areas that I know of to keep runoff or 
coast, coastal development or, or increased impervious surface or any of that from impacting our farm sites into the future. You know, they really, I just told Troy, they needed to be protected probably 25 years ago before all the development started. And now any protections that we're trying to put into place, the development's happening so fast, it's almost like we can't keep up. So that's a big, the jury's still out on how that's going to play out over the next decade here as, as we continue to see a development boom as well as an aquaculture boom at the same time. We have those things kind of in conflict with one another and they need to figure out a way to be more harmonious. So that's that's one thing that we are looking to try to do is, you know, work work with some of the developments and the municipalities to try to figure out ways to mitigate and protect our farm sites. Ocean acidification, that's something I threw up there. West Coast has had some issues with uh, baby oysters not being able to set and grow due to ocean acidification. And so that could be something in the future we see happening here on the East Coast. Um, expensive startup costs is not something you just want to cruise into with no money. I pulled it up from the bootstraps. I didn't put the picture on here, but my first sorting tube was a a big compost tumbler that I bought and I would just go out there and pour oysters in it and throw a bucket of water in it and turn it by hand, you know, and I did that for the first 150,000 oysters until I told my wife the first investment we're making is sorted. Yeah. Okay. So Keith, I, this group's really interested in the, in the entrepreneurship part of this. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the expenses? Yeah. So, so, uh, well, cages, you know, your infrastructure, the first thing you have to have is water. So you have to go through the leasing process with the state or you have to purchase the water outside of the leasing program from a farmer or someone who owns what's called a franchise. So that's the first step, getting through that process. Once you have the water, then you have to build out your infrastructure. You've got to have cages. You've got to anchor all those cages. You've got to have all your rope and all your lines. You've got to have all your bags. You've got to have sorting equipment. Labor is probably our biggest expense along with fuel. You got to fuel all your boats. You got to have boats. You got to have truck to pull the boat. You know, there's a lot of startup costs and a lot of things you have to do to really compete in the aquaculture industry. And um, we wanted to keep it a family business. So we were approached by other people who wanted to, you know, partner with us or invest in our company. And we elected to keep the, the business in the family. So I spent the first two years using 0% credit cards and bouncing balances around until I got enough money to just pay all those off. And so that got me through the startup phase. And now we're in the growth phase. And, you know, we have some operating cash to work with now. And we have, uh, like I said, a respectable market share and money coming in. But the initial startup was, was tough. And I did it while working a 40-hour week or more full-time job as an environmental consultant and did it on the weekends as a weekend warrior for the first two years before I ever even hired anyone. Once I got to about 120 cages that I had to flip by myself, I decided I better start bringing in some help. And so we brought people in at that point. But labor is our number one cost. Fuel, hope fuel's not cheap, you know. And uh, for a lot of farmers, finding a landing, you know, I mean, a lot of farmers use the public boat ramps, and we use them sometimes too, but they're a nightmare for trying to run a commercial fishing operation or an aquaculture operation and, and dealing with people at, in and out of the boat ramps is a huge efficiency killer. You know, I mean, it slows us down. So I actually own a piece of property on the water in Sneeds Ferry that luckily we bought before the housing market and the interest rates went crazy and we were able to get it, but we've already outgrown it but it gives us a private boat slip that we can use to go back and forth to our farms and avoid some of that mess. Most farmers don't have that. And when, when you're talking about aquaculture, you're looking for a piece of property that is within close proximity of your farm, on the water preferably, and with enough acreage that you can have, you know, all your cages and all those things around. Most of those places are already owned and have million dollar mansions on them. So, you know, the place for an oyster farmer is not the same as a farmhouse for a terrestrial farmer over in Maple Hill or wherever it is. 
if we want to be close to our farms, we have to be on the water and waterfront property is not cheap. So that's a huge startup expense. And those people who don't have that, I try to look into the future and get that. What I got is not perfect, but it's better than what a lot of guys have. Those people that don't have that, you know, they're driving back and forth using public boat ramps can't get out to their farm in an emergency without having to take a long run. So there's a number of things like that that, that are expensive startup costs. That's a great question, Troy. Yeah. Can see if we can answer any other questions from the crowd. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah can we go? Yeah, start. So let's go ahead and turn it over to this. Yeah. This is this is what, what our future stuff is here, where we're headed for the future. And uh, you know, that's that's really the last slide anyway. But uh, if anyone has any questions, we, we were planning to do some farm tours. We're working on that. We're working on adding clams to our operation, uh, finishing the development of our website, working on farmers market, working at farmers markets, trying to boost some online sales to get out there a little bit further from the regional distribution that we use. And then this thing is called a Pearlception. And, and that's something that we ordered last year and that we are hoping to have soon. It can process, clean, bag, 10,000 oysters an hour. So that actually will reduce my future labor costs because I hire <laughs> that instead. I don't pay insurance on that. I don't pay workers' comp on that. It doesn't call in sick. And it can produce and grade way more oysters than any of my employees. The big I'm sure they'd love that, to hear that, by the way. <laughs> Is that it maintains quality. Right now, I touch every oyster because I'm a perfectionist and a chef, and I like to see them before they go to market. So I personally hand grade the oysters. This will allow me to plug in the parameters that I want, and it uses lasers and photography to take a picture of every single oyster. And if it meets the criteria that I put in, it will bag it. If it doesn't, it will go back on the farm. So the that's, uh, take that's what the big boys use, and that's what we're. So at. Let's, let's go. Let's go ahead and give him a hand and open it up. Here. You got a bunch of uh, hands. Sure, anybody. Um, just call them out. So, someone who knows nothing about oyster farming, you talked at the start about your method compared to traditional method, and you said like bottom and column or something. Wait, just yeah. So. so in order to grow oysters in the water column in the floating cages that I showed you before, you have to lease the bottom from the state and you have to lease the water column above the submerged land. Um, traditionally, water column leases weren't even available at one point, I don't think. And if they were, nobody was really using them. Most people would just grow their oysters on the bottom. When you say water column, you mean a square foot of water literally rising I mean, directly above. If I'm standing in chest, if I'm standing in chest deep water on the bottom, anything above that bottom up to my chest, that's the, pretty much the water column. So in the water, basically, not on the bottom, and that that allows more oxygen, more food, keeps your oysters from getting muddy, those things. Okay. Yep. How do you purchase water? You lease it. You don't purchase it, and you lease you it from the you state. You have to purchase water. So you have to lease it. It's yeah. a lease program. So the state has a leasing program and you go through a leasing process and you have to basically select an area. They come out, look at the area, determine if it meets their criteria, if it's suitable for aquaculture. And if it is, then they allow you to lease that location from the state and it goes into their leasing program. So, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and interrupt just for a second. Uh, that was actually one of the reasons we started our aquaculture siding tool back in 2011, because from the time someone put in an application to the time they might hear whether they could start their farm or not, might have been 24 months. And so we just simply took all the public data that everybody else would have used, and we put it out so that people could could make those judgments and avoid the complex. So, so that's a big deal. So, yeah. um, so getting the lease is great. Um, what does that look like going forward? Do you have it in perpetuity? How long's the It's details? a 10 year lease. And, and so at the end of 10 years, can somebody come in and like jump you and outbid you? Do they, yeah. you have, basically you have the first right of refusal. Yes. Okay. But you have to meet production requirements during those 10 years in order to be, um, to even be able to renew the lease. So basically yeah. check five boxes and okay, then. You have to plant X number of oysters and or sell X number of oysters per year. And that's based on the amount of acreage 
So you have to sell a certain amount of bushels per acre. And so uh, that's how that works. Yeah. So, and, and we're five probably years in. Probably need to move to the, our next presentation. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, so Keith knows huge amounts about the farming process and all that, but he's also a perfectionist when it comes to producing an oyster. So it, I've never seen anybody that puts as much time into the actual individual oysters. So, so uh, if, you want, if, you want, if you want to talk about eating a perfect oyster, again, this is the guy you want to talk to. Our next presenter is Allison Bowman. Right? And he is actually helping us raise awareness of the blue economy through his photography. And uh, he's done some fantastic work. I love this picture he's, he's brought here. Um, and you also do surf photography as well mm -hmm. and uh, and other things. I'm going to yeah. stop talking and uh, thank you. And uh, you guys go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, I currently run a sole proprietorship. Um, we affectionately call it Ocean Dweller Media um, because that's the real product here. Um, I am a uh, transitioning it to an LLC because we're starting to do some other things. So you'll see a presentation of kind of both sides of the, the, the organization. Uh, my name is Allison Bowman. I'm a physics major at UNCW. I'm in my senior year. Um, I'm also currently working on a uh, neutrino double beta decay uh, research program up at Duke University. Um, um, as my internship for the summer, um, I'm doing a couple of other things that are physics research related. Um, but I have, uh, grew up, I grew up in the Outer Banks. I have lived in North Carolina for most of my life and, um, have been a real, real passionate advocate for the oceans and our, uh, relationship with water, I think is, is a more broad way of talking about um, the nuances of that. Um, this was on a cave diving expedition that we did in March of this year. This was my spring break, um, advocating for freshwater rights. And so we'll talk about that as well. So uh, we're gonna talk about the beliefs of this particular organization, um, what we're currently doing in the local area, and then what we do outside of the Cape Fear region as well. So the beliefs that I hold is that, um, we drastically underestimate the value of our water, just broadly. Um, and the nuances of this are not so obvious on the, on the East Coast where we have plenty of water. Um, most of it, people don't even like to swim in all that much anymore. Um, and the, the nice stuff, the nice blue stuff, can't get to, can't drink that stuff anyway. Um, and uh, if you want water to drink, it comes in a bottle usually or from the city. And those have problems with them as well. So uh, understanding the nuances of all these different kinds of relationships is what I try and work on um, from all the different kinds of angles. Um, what we're currently doing here in Wilmington um, is uh, started with doing fine art photography uh, and print work. So you can, you're close enough, you can see one of my pieces uh, is right there. That's um, uh, winter slumber. I was taken this January off the coast of Wilmington. Um, they're all metal works, and the current show is Cape Fear Ocean Dwellers. It's at the Art and Bloom Gallery open over in Mayfair. Um, the entire show is about showcasing how uh, lush our, our sea life is, even in the depths of winter, um, and how you can really dispel the notions that like our waters are green and mucky and can't be seen in anything. Um, and not subtropical. There are definitely subtropical waters off the coast of North Carolina. So uh, this was a, a, a print that's currently in the show uh, of a bait ball that we were diving in. And the bait ball was 120 feet tall and as dense as you could possibly see, um, and which is, you know dispels most of the notions about um, what the, the vast ocean off of our coast looks like in the wintertime. You know, empty waters, uh, nothing's going on. Um, one of the other facets of our waters is that we have shipwrecks uh, out the wazoo, um, dating back to World War II, the Civil War, um, as well as natural shipwrecks. And so they provide a crucial um, site for nurturing uh, adolescent subtropical fish. And uh, so this is a, a portrait of one of them. 
uh, inside one of the walls of the shipwreck, you can see the studs in the back of the wall there uh, poking out. It also gives you a reference for the size of the fish. It's a redding blooper, but it's relatively adolescent. Can you say, well, I had two screens because you're showing photography. I want to be able to sure. show uh, if we're missing a screen or two on the same spot, you can see the other on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're missing on one side, you get on the other, right? Yeah. Um, so this is this is another one of the pieces um, in the current show, um, and I also wanted to acknowledge the one person that helped me with this show. Um, this is Roger Malone. He was my lighting grip, and he helped uh, manage our life support resources uh, for the expedition. Um, Roger is also a UNCW student. He teaches scuba diving uh, at the natatorium and the PED uh, 104 class, and is a uh, geology major, a terrific diver. And as you can see here, he's also in the bait hole with me, just uh, pointing his lights around, but we're, you know, it's just dark. We can't see anything through it. And it's just because of how much light is present here. Uh, we also wanted to tell some of the stories closer to shore, make it, uh, make it as, as relatable as possible uh, from other facets of, of our relationship to water. And so part of our ocean dwellers are the surf community here locally in Wrightsville and, and elsewhere. Um, this is Hurricane Fiona and exploring that relationship that many of us have with our hurricanes. Uh, it is obviously mixed, but there is a huge economy uh, that's growing in the pursuit of surfing hurricane swells. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so this is Hurricane Fiona last uh, fall, um, uh, surfer dropping into a suspiciously Caribbean looking wave. But I promise you, this was here in Wrightsville. Um, so that's that's the current show. You can see it until July 2nd uh, in Wrightsville Beach. Um, it's at the uh, Mayfair Shopping Center. Um, the Art and Bloom Gallery is there. Um, they used to be downtown. Some of you will recognize the, the, the title of the gallery. They have since moved locations. My previous show uh, was a year ago and was um, introspective about how our experiences with the pandemic, specifically uh, in the coastal regions, um, brought us new experiences and so this piece was uh the fractal geometry of rebirth and explores many of our relationships with the flowers that we buy annually and uh how we maybe bought some more flowers than we expected to during the pandemic years and that was sometimes a good thing and sometimes it wasn't such a good thing um these personally uh were the uh, last set of flowers i i harvested from the, the garden i i planted in my childhood home before we sold it during the pandemic. Um, so th this, this particular piece is very near and dear to me, um, but the fractal geometry says that while, uh, while growth is, is inevitable, uh, there is reproductive processes in it that produce the same pattern in different ways. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just to the chat, you're good. Um, this is another piece from the previous show. This is called Homebreak, and it explores our relationship with our nature, natural places uh, and how many of us kind of rediscovered our um, passions for nature during the pandemic, whether it was nightly walks to, uh, to blow off steam uh, or uh, fishing trips to get away from the family. Uh, a lot of us took time to redevelop our relationship with nature. And so this is uh, Jeanette's Pier up in the Outer Banks. Um, and it's also an appreciation of how the state has already invested in our ability to access nature um, and how many of us re, uh, rediscovered that during the pandemic. Um, so here locally, um, most often I'm recognized by a different title. I'm recognized as surf photographer, Allison Bowman. Uh, and so some of my works presented here, I do a couple kinds of surf photography and surf videography. So that's me swimming around in the waves and uh, getting passed by surfers left and right, uh, which produces uh, images like this, or it's uh, using telephoto lenses. Um, I try and capture and tell the stories of many just passionate uh, amateur surfers all the way up to uh, pro and semi-pro surfers that uh, are here developing our surf economy um, and mentoring things like charities, and having relationships to major brands that wouldn't otherwise know about the Wilmington area, Wrightsville Beach, 
um, and the communities we have here. But at long last, not everything happens in the Cape Fear region, although we try and believe it does. Um, so my uh, passion for exploring stories about water has taken me elsewhere in the U.S. and internationally from time to time as well. And so uh, this was from the same expedition I talked about earlier uh, in March. Uh, we've been doing expeditions now for three years, uh, exploring underwater caves and documenting underwater caves. And it seems very nuanced. I know it's underwater cave diving. Why do we care about this? Uh, surely it's something that bored people do when they have too much money. Uh, <laughs> um, it's tremendously important. The bottled water you guys have drunk in the last month is probably at some percentage come from underwater uh, aqueducts like this one. Uh, there's a major karst development in the karst, uh, karst region in uh, Castle Haynes. Uh, and as well, there's a much larger one in uh, North Florida. And companies like Nestle and other water bottling companies steal this water uh, whenever they can. It's part of the, uh, the environmental protections that we're working really hard to, to advocate for. So telling stories about remote places and um, fossil digs and uh, the... the uh, the archaeology that can still be done in these places, uh, the extent at which these resources exist, uh, and fundamentally exploring our aquifers is what this work is about. Uh, mapping these cave systems eventually leads you to the aquifers, and, and so some organizations have already done some work to that extent. We are uh, early stages of that. And so this was partnering with a, a local business to, uh, to do tourism, but uh, fundamentally, we wanted to support tourism industries in these kinds of environments over water bottling uh, permits and, and whatnot in those regions. Um, so we, we try and tell these stories from a number of different angles, uh, but fundamentally explore um, our relationships with water. Um, and it's, uh, it's very cute and nice to say that we're just a camera company or we just sell photos, uh, but... I'm a technologist at heart. My first business was in high school developing intellectual property for drones. And so I'm never satisfied with that. Uh, we're currently developing a couple of software uh, tools that are going to be used for um, analyzing surf photography and allowing it to assist in uh, the medical recommendations for surfers, as well as athletic recommendations. And uh, on the cave diving side, we're, we're building out tools to help do mapping without risking human life and, and so on. Um, I didn't bring any resources for that. A lot of it's proprietary, um, but I gave you a nice picture of a wave to compensate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, sorry, I went over, over a little, but uh, so I've got two QR codes for you guys. One is the Instagram account where a lot of these stories are told and you can get updates on, on the work that we're currently doing and work I'm currently doing and work I'm not currently doing and posting pictures about anyway. Um, and then the QR code for the uh, online um, gallery. So it's in person, but you can see the works online as well. Great, thank, thank you. you. I think we have uh, some requests from the community, what, you, what you'd like from the, this group. Understand your water, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, if you can come by and, and support my artwork, it helps pay for everything else. Um, and uh, yeah. Enjoy your, your, your natural resources. Do we have questions? How many times have you been run into doing surf photography? Once, really. Only once. Um, as a kid, I have some nerve damage in my leg as a result. Um, but I learned the lesson the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, it, it, uh, it can definitely hurt you bad. Um, and so anytime you swim out, you try and make the judgment call whether it's going to be safe or not. Um, but we have a very cute, courteous community here. It's not like Huntington Beach or, or uh, the North Shore of Hawaii. Everybody's very nice. Everybody's very nice. Localism isn't too bad. You want to come do some photography in the estuary? <laughs> some oyster farming activities? So the water quality in the, or the water clarity in the wintertime is actually very clear. Um, I've done some drone stuff out there on our farm, um, but... There's a story to be told. 
So if you'd like to tell a story about estuary and water and that interface between, uh, you know, the riverine systems and the ocean coming together, then that's a great place to do it. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll talk afterwards. Yeah, I got a business card for you. Perfect. Anybody else? Everyone's so afraid of sharks. Tell me how many interactions you've had. What's it been like? Okay. How many attempted bites? <laughs> That's one of my favorite questions, actually. Uh, I used to run a dive business down in Florida while I was doing my first years in college. So I was down at Ember Riddle in Daytona Beach. And um, we would dive all over the place. We'd dive springs, we'd dive inlets, we'd dive on boats in Florida. Uh, in Southern Florida, uh, we'd dive the Keys. We, we had 1,400 divers that would want to go out at least once a month. And so I was scheduling places all over the, all over the state. Um, but one of the trips I enjoyed was the baited, cageless shark diving trip out of uh, Palm Beach and uh, Jupiter Inlet. And uh, it's with bull sharks, tiger sharks, occasionally a hammerhead, and lemon sharks when they're in migration. Uh, and these are fully matured, you know, 14 foot bull sharks. And uh, everybody goes, Ooh, I couldn't do that. Uh, but what we did that trip for, while it's uh, ethically questionable, um, we tried to mitigate how many times it would happen because feeding sharks is never a good thing, uh, unless it makes the sharks more valuable in water than out of water, right? Um, we would do the trip about three times a year. We would fully pack the boat. We'd go out, everybody's very nervous, get in the water, get in the water, and they're like little dogs in the sense that they understand that you're a predator, you're in charge of your own space, they respect you. If you're not, if you're flailing about, or if you're sending out signals that you are vulnerable prey, they will try and see you if, if you taste good. And so I think sharks get a bad rap. Um, they are terribly misunderstood because most of the time when people hear about interactions, uh, it's like when they didn't even see it, it would just bit their foot and swam off. Fundamentally, we're, we're pretty vulnerable as humans. And so um, if a shark does bite you, especially a large one, it's probable that it's going to hit a vital artery. Um, and you'll likely bleed out before it even eats you. Fun that's, good. Fun that's not a very positive <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, but you will never right. the probability you will ever encounter a shark at large is zero to oh. nil right. um, those sharks exist in deep water only almost there are some exceptions uh, in migratory patterns and whatnot and uh, they don't come to the surface and they don't come to bait easily and so what you learn from these shark dives uh, the people who went on them uh, was that the 14 foot bull shark or the 18 foot tiger sharks would come up at the very end of the dive because it was a pecking order thing. They wanted the younger sharks passed out to see if it was safe. And they're, they're smart enough to know. So I've never been attacked by a yeah. shark yeah. in a vicious way. Yeah. I've certainly deflected sharks in water. I saw a shark in right school. It's about this long. Uh, and it was just scooting along the bottom three weeks ago, uh, just doing surf photography. Um, I usually pay good money to see them, so I'm never upset. Thank you. Allison, great presentation. Um, what's your favorite kind of photography to do? You mentioned like underwater, above water, on a board. Which is kind of your favorite thing you can do? I really enjoy the underwater cave photography. Um, it's uh, fresh water. It's the same temperature year round. Um, and there's a, a special back to the wound kind of feel because of how dark it is. Uh, you get in a, a sinkhole in the ground. Uh, some of us have dove in the sinkholes. Ginny Springs is a very common destination for us. Um, cheap vacations down in Florida, uh, the Wakala State National Parks and whatnot. Um, you get in the sinkhole and it's it's like, okay, this is a, a rocky, muddy spa space to be, but you those go for tens of miles underwater, underground. And so you can be, you know, in that expedition we were on, we were three miles, I'm sorry, three hours of swimming from an entrance. Uh, we had enough uh, cubic feet of gas to supply a small submarine uh, for each of us. Um, and the process is very rewarding in the sense that it's very calm. 
It's not an adrenaline junkie kind of activity. It's very meditative uh, and it's very regulated. When you get in the ocean, you're just hoping the, the boat picks you up afterward, really. Uh, I've been on enough dive boats <laughs> You are really rolling, rolling dice. We really got, we really got to start selling this blue economy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in a cave dive, you there is a line that takes you all the way to the entrance and all the way back. And your job is just to swim it, swim it properly, manage your gas well, and plan correctly, and you'll be better. <laughs> and so it's a very rewarding process. Yeah. I'm curious about you as an entrepreneur. It sounds like you've been involved in a lot of things with drones. With photography you're a physicist i'm wondering what's next for you <laughs> i think some of this <laughs> um we're really excited for this um it's a uh, computer vision model um myself and one of my buddies is de um, we're developing but he's got some visa issues he's a he's an international student so he can't technically work on anything uh, so he's donating his time at this point um uh, but i think this could really help not only the surf, uh, surf industry, um, getting analytics, live analytics to surfers and the way that they surf, um, making it more accessible to people. A lot of the issue with these kinds of water sports is that to be good at them, to, to enjoy them at a very high level, uh, you need uh, attention, coaching, uh, and consistency that doesn't exist in most people's lives, um, whether that's a financial in, um, obstacle or it's a community obstacle. Um, and so breaking down those barriers is, is what we aim to do, but I think it could help on a much you know, larger level for anything that's watched as a spectacle like sport. Um, I'm a tennis player. I was you know, a varsity tennis player in, in high school, not to toot my own horn, but it's a family thing that my family does. And for the number of hours I've spent on court, I wish I could just set up a camera and get you know, information about the way I play. And so delivering that as a, as a concise package is not, uh, been done, uh, we think. There are certainly, you know, the intellectual property exists, um, but uh, packaging that and delivering it in a, in a palatable way to people that uh, have a workflow for their, their hobbies like surfing is what we aim to do. We got a question on Zoom. Okay. Is Olivia, come up Olivia, you? I'm, there you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm with the North Carolina Military Business Center at um, Cape Fear Community College. Um, my question is, have you thought at all about doing any R&D within the DOD or, you know, with Department of Defense or within the federal government? So I have a little bit of experience doing uh, DOD work. Um, I was at the Naval Research Labs in 2016, 2017, and 2018 doing, like, semiconductor research. Um, but... The business side of things, I really don't have any experience with. I, I don't know who I would even partner with, to be honest with you. Um, so um, I'm actually, so what I do is uh, as I am the military uh, business development um, professional that does that. So uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to make, you know, let's get uh, together with that because we do a lot of R&D um, and 90% of the time that goes, it ends up going up into the triangle. And I really think that something down here in our, you know, in our area in the Tri-County that we have individuals like yourself that bring a unique perspective that they tend to forget about, it, especially when it comes to, you know, you went to Emory Riddle, you know, you already have this experience and with your, um, with the model that you're looking into uh, and as far as the analytics and whatnot, um, I think that it would really help with our divers as well as within the um, the sub-community. So um, I'll make sure that you get my information. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Look forward to yeah. talking with you. Dude, we're going to end it there. Great job. <laughs> Does that have any further questions or I guess want to buy the print if it's for sale? Um, <laughs> talk to Allison after. So we thank uh, Keith and Allison for presenting today. Or moving to community announcements if Heather's got anything where Carol gets anything before we leave. But we got two presenters next week. Yeah, um, we have to continue it on with the blue economy. Great, two yeah. presenters next week. I'm excited because we got Allison. He literally came in his first one wearing cops last week. Oh, yeah. The turnover was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Yes, yeah, so we don't have uh, one wearing cops July 5th because it's a holiday and we know women can like to celebrate America. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe too much.
Yeah. 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 Push it back to 11. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, hey, Josh, the camera. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce has our Young Professionals Council meeting on Thursday. Um, the open sure. session opened to uh, anybody is at 4 50, 4 45, something like that. In the in the afternoon, we've got a special guest speaker from the Wilmington and Beaches, um, our tourism folks, to, mm -hmm. to talk about the relationship between young people in tourism. So, is it become? Yeah, and our uh, young professional advisory council meeting is this Thursday. Yeah, that's what's, that's yep, what's that, yep. And so, if you're um, maybe the entrepreneurship uh, club guy or or Allison, maybe. Um, <laughs> Uh, just calling people out. Yeah, you should come. You by personally by me, because I'm a part of it, and I'd love to be able to come. We good to have y'all. Uh, anyone else for community announcements? Yeah, Heather. MC idea, July thirty first at noon at the surf. You wanted free pizza. It's on CIE website. I like pizza. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. And now we go to. I like doing uh, this last uh, new. If you want to uh, introduce yourself and kind of what you do, I kind of like to do as a segue into where networking might happen afterwards. So, if you're new, if you want to stand up and kind of tell us what you do, I don't know. I'm calling you. <laughs> you don't have to, I'm just giving you a chance. <laughs> going once, going twice. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us. <laughs> That's your summer, and um, I'm still summer, summer saying that. Yeah. Uh, see you yeah. Same next week. Yeah. Have a great week. Um, enjoy the humidity today. All right. Thanks for the. Thank you, Nicole. Have a good one. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah